the goal of uh, what I'm presenting today uh, is to try and assess uh, the potential impact of introducing an alternative mortgage design which shares house price risk uh, between the mortgage borrower and the mortgage lender uh, using an estimated uh, structural model of the mortgage and housing market. And so before I go into uh, detail about what precisely I mean by an alternative mortgage contract, um, let me first say a few words about uh, the motivation. So uh, this research is um, mainly motivated by the housing crisis, which I think has uh, revealed some weaknesses in the way we uh, currently finance our home purchases. Uh, so in particular, uh, conventional fixed and adjustable rate mortgages uh, are such that uh, the nominal value of the mortgage debt is fixed with respect to house prices, but house prices themselves can, of course, fluctuate. And so this is great uh, for homeowners uh, when house prices are appreciating rapidly, uh, such as they were in the early and mid-2000s. Um, but of course, it's not so great when house prices collapse, uh, as they did in 2007, 2008. Um, and so, in particular, when the value of your house falls below the nominal value uh, of the outstanding balance on your mortgage, uh, we say that you're underwater on your loan or that you have negative equity, okay? Uh, and a growing body of literature um, suggests that there could be um, a lot of inefficiencies associated with the condition of being underwater. The first and most obvious uh, is that being underwater can be thought of as a necessary condition for defaulting on your mortgage, uh, because if you weren't underwater, you could simply sell your house and pay off the mortgage rather than defaulting. Um, and there's, of course, a large and established body of literature which shows that there are social costs attached to the process of default and foreclosure, which we would do well to avoid. Um, but second, there could also be labor market consequences uh, through reduced mobility of homeowners who are underwater on their mortgage, because if they want to sell their house and move, they would have to pay off the difference, which they may not have the liquidity to do so. And third, there could be effects uh, on aggregate consumption through the effect on household balance sheets. Okay? Uh, and so in this paper, we're going to consider uh, an alternative mortgage contract that shares house price risk between the borrower and the lender. And the contract does this by explicitly indexing the terms of the mortgage contract uh, to a measure of local house prices. And the specific kind of contract that we'll be looking at today uh, is a kind of fully indexed contract, which indexes the mortgage both on the upside of house price appreciation and on the downside of house price depreciation. And in this sense, it both provides insurance to the borrower in the case that house prices fall um, but it also allows lenders to share in the capital gains uh, to house price appreciation. Now, these might not be the only contracts you might think about looking at. You might also think about a mortgage contract that only insures the borrower on the downside, but doesn't index the mortgage on the upside. Um, but at least in the context of my model, uh, in previous versions uh, of the work, I found that in terms of consumer welfare, uh, the fully indexed mortgage uh, provides uh, a larger total surplus. And so for the pur purposes today, I'm only going to look at a sort of fully indexed uh, mortgage. So um, I should say that I'm not, of course, I'm not the first person to have thought of these mortgages. Um, they've been around uh, before in the form of shared appreciation mortgages, although these never really took off in the US. Um, and recently, uh, Bob Schiller has been really advocating for what he calls continuous workout mortgages. Uh, and the difference between the two is that a shared appreciation mortgage uh, indexes the mortgage to the actual transaction value of the house itself, okay, which by itself raises some concerns about uh, moral hazard and the incentives to perform maintenance and upgrades. Um, and a continuous workout mortgage indexes the mortgage to a local house price index, say a zip code or a neighborhood level index. <coughs> For the purposes of the paper, though, um, they'll be the same because I'll be abstracting away uh, from some of the issues which would create differences in these two implementations. Um, of course, uh, there are many reasons to think that these kinds of risk-sharing mortgages would benefit homeowners. 
Uh, the first is that housing, as we know, um, plays a very large share in most homeowners' wealth portfolios. And so if homeowners are risk averse, uh, as we think they probably are, then they naturally benefit from being able to uh, diversify away some of that housing risk. The second is that homeowners can be more exposed to local spatial risks, which affect their local housing market, uh, such as local labor market shocks, than their lenders. And so it may be efficient for them to offload some of that local idiosyncratic risk onto their lenders. Uh, and finally, uh, the mortgage contracts can be designed in such a way as to eliminate the possibility of going underwater on their loan and therefore avoid many of the costs associated with that. Uh, so this is a schematic which just plots uh, the loan to value ratio uh, of a mortgage with respect to the cumulative house price appreciation uh, that has been experienced since the time of origination. And so the blue line plots uh, the loan to value ratio for a fixed rate mortgage. And uh, what I really want to just highlight is that uh, there's a certain region of your experience of house price appreciation, which would cause you to fall underwater on your loan, meaning you have a loan to value ratio greater than 100%. Um, but for a continuous workout mortgage, it doesn't matter what's happened to cumulative house price appreciation, uh, your loan to value ratio remains fixed. And so the wedge between the fixed rate and the continuous workout mortgage can be thought of uh, here as a cost to the lender, like a value of insurance that the lender is providing on the downside. And the wedge here on the right can be thought of as a benefit to the lender, a sort of sharing in the capital gains appreciation uh, on the upside. <coughs> so the specific questions um, I'm going to address today are uh, first, so what would the interest rate um, of a risk sharing mortgage have to be in a competitive equilibrium relative to the interest rate of a fixed rate mortgage? Because af as we've seen, uh, the payoffs to the lender could be completely different uh, than for a fixed rate mortgage. Second is, um, what would the take up rate of risk sharing mortgages be uh, if they were introduced as an option in the mortgage market? Third, what would the welfare impacts be of introducing these risk sharing mortgages? And finally, what would be the effect of introducing risk-sharing mortgages on equilibrium default rates. <coughs> uh, and I also want to be upfront about some questions that I'm specifically not addressing today. Um, I obviously think these are important questions, and I hope to address them uh, in future work, or that someone addresses them in future work. Um, but what, what I'm not going to address is uh, what's going to be the general equilibrium effect of introducing these mortgages on house price dynamics. Uh, I think that's a very important question, um, especially since um, we know how foreclosures uh, can have an effect on property prices uh, in your nearby neighborhood. And to the extent that we can um, prevent foreclosures, there could be you know, uh, equilibrium effects on house prices through the introduction of these mortgages. But I'm not going to address that today. Uh, the second is I won't be addressing why risk-sharing mortgages are not more prevalent in U.S. mortgage markets. Um, again, I think this is an important question as well. Um, there are a number of good answers to the question, um, but I'm happy to talk about it uh, sort of uh, during the question time or, uh, or in person. And finally, I'm not sort of solving for the optimal mortgage design in the face of house price risk. Rather, I'm going to empirically assess what the impacts would be of introducing a specific kind of mortgage design, which may be more optimal than what we have now, but it may not be the optimal design. <coughs> okay, so let me give a sort of brief overview in words of the model. Um, so we have a local housing and mortgage market, uh, which is populated by uh, consumers, i.e. homeowners, um, and a representative risk-neutral competitive lender, okay? And the lender doesn't have to be risk-neutral, um, I'm assuming that for convenience, but it just has to be either less risk averse than the consumers or sort of less exposed to the sort of idiosyncratic risks that the consumers face. Um, so consumers have a quantity of housing that they wish to buy, and by quantity I mean like a number of quality units, right? Uh, and they initially decide how much to borrow in order to finance that purchase, and if applicable they decide what kind of mortgage contract to use, a conventional mortgage uh, or a risk-sharing mortgage. So at each su period subsequent to the initial purchase, 
uh, the consumers face house price risk, they face um, unemployment risk, uh, and they face an exogenous probability of having to move in each period. Okay? And then given these risks, the consumers in each period decide to either pay down the mortgage, okay, or they can decide to default on the mortgage. <coughs> And if they default, that's going to be costly to both the consumers and the lenders. It's going to result in immediate foreclosure and it forces consumers into the rental market. So this is how the model ties uh, the effect of equity uh, into um, the default decision endogenously. <coughs> the model is going to be estimated um, uh, using a micro data set on ownership histories from Los Angeles uh, from 1993 to 2008. And so when I say an ownership history, what I mean is that uh, we observe um, a home purchaser at the time of the initial purchase. Uh, we see how much, uh, we see what kind of house they bought, how much they paid for it, and how much they borrowed in order to finance that purchase. And then we follow the owner until the time at which they either sell the house or default on the mortgage or until the end of the data period. And so what we do is, uh, or what I do is we, I, uh, we, sorry, <laughs> we use observed default behavior uh, to estimate the parameters of the consumer's decision problem, right? So this includes uh, their risk aversion parameters, their cost of defaulting, et cetera. And then we use the estimated default and prepayment risks uh, to calculate the lender's expected returns in each period, okay? And so in the counterfactual, what we do is we use the estimated parameters and the lender's estimated returns. We hold fix the lender's returns, okay? And we introduce the new mortgage contract. We let the consumers endogenously decide between conventional mortgages and the risk sharing contract. And we let the interest rate on the risk sharing mortgage contract adjust so that the lender's return is held fixed, okay? And so that's going to be the counterfactual. And so let me give a brief overview of results. Um, I find that uh, risk sharing mortgages are less expensive during periods of expected house price uh, appreciation, uh, which is not surprising, of course, um, and more expensive during periods of expected house price decline. But what is interesting is that I find that take-up rates are actually higher during periods of expected house price growth and lower during periods of expected house price decline. And this is sort of a non-obvious result because we would expect that um, fixing conditional on the interest rate, consumers are for sure better off under a fixed rate than under a uh, risk sharing <coughs> mortgage if house prices are going to go up for sure, right? <coughs> but remember, um, we're letting the interest rates adjust endogenously, so it could be that uh, the additional price of the risk sharing mortgage contract um, is enough to induce them to not take up the mortgage. Uh, I find that the welfare gains from introducing um, the risk sharing mortgage contract uh, in the period from 1993 to 2008 uh, results in an increase in consumer welfare uh, of a consumption equivalent of about $3,000 per household per year. Uh, and I find that default rates would have been much lower and especially during the crisis period. <coughs> okay, so let me uh, go over the model in more detail. Um, but quickly. Uh, so we have households which are indexed by I and they're born at time S. Okay, and this is a finite horizon model uh, with cap T periods. And so consumers are endowed with a deterministic and constant real income stream, uh, except they face a probability of unemployment in each period. Uh, and they're also endowed with an initial wealth, W. Okay, so in, uh, in the initial period, uh, each consumer has a number of units of housing that they want to purchase at a constant unit price. Uh, and the household decides the amount of down payment that he pays out of his wealth. And uh, the amount of down payment and the price of the house is going to determine the amount of loan that he needs to borrow. <coughs> so households, they care about consumption of a numerator good. And they care about uh, total wealth at the time of a move. Uh, the households move with an exogenous probability tau in each period, uh, except the final period where they move with probability 1. And so a household that moves at time t evaluates consumption flows according to a time-separable CRRA, CRRA utility function uh, with risk aversion parameter gamma. 
So housing is treated as a perfectly divisible and hom homogeneous good uh, with the constant unit price P in each period. Uh, and I assume that house price appreciation uh, just follows an AR1 process. <clears throat> okay, so um, let's discuss mortgage contracts. Um, I assume uh, in the baseline model that households finance their home purchase using uh, fixed rate mortgages with a maturity of cap T and that they can finance up to 100% of the purchase if they so desire. <laughs> and so the principal and interest payment for a fixed rate uh, is given by this, and the balance uh, simply evolves according to this, which just results in constant amortization over uh, T periods. So households can save at a, a risk-free, one period risk-free rate of R, um, but I assume that they can't borrow, um, except in the initial period to finance their home purchase. And so this gives uh, the standard uh, household budget constraints, <coughs> where MIT, MIT is the um, mortgage payment, and S is the savings. Okay, so households are required to move with the probability tau in each period. Um, if the household is required to move, it either sells the house or it defaults, okay? Uh, and so if it sells, its final wealth is simply the price of the house minus the loan. Okay, plus their savings. Um, if they default, then they pay a utility cost of C plus epsilon, okay, where epsilon is some idiosyncratic shock to your costs of defaulting. Uh, and then you're uh, you get foreclosed immediately, but you also write off your loan. And so your final wealth is just your savings. I'm going to allow epsilon to be um, a type one extreme value distribution, uh, which simplifies some of the computation. And it reflects, uh, as I said, idiosyncratic reasons for needing to default. So households are assumed to only sell their house um, when they're required to move. And so if they're not required to move, then the, house deci the household decides to either pay down the mortgage or to default and go into the rental market, okay? So the value of paying down the mortgage uh, is simply the optimization uh, of your today's consumption stream uh, plus sort of your expected future value of consumption streams, right, uh, taking into your budget constraint, the current mortgage payment. The value function for defaulting uh, is the same thing, except instead of paying the mortgage payment, uh, you pay the rental rate, okay? And I assume a constant price to rent ratio in the economy. Uh, and then you pay a utility cost of C plus epsilon, uh, as is the case when we're deciding to sell or default in the case of a move. And so uh, for the lenders in each period, uh, there's going to be a competitive lender, which provides mortgages uh, to the entire set of buyers in that period. Um, so the lender is assumed to hold on to the mortgage portfolio uh, for cap T periods, and they reinvest any flows of receipts into uh, the riskless rate. And, and you have five more minutes. Oh, OK. Um, I thought I had more. So let me simply. Uh, say a few words about um, estimation. Uh, no, let me, let me just jump to model fit and results. Um, so I estimated the model. And, uh, so the model gives a pretty good fit of the data in terms of uh, default rates by purchase year. OK, um, I overestimate default a little bit uh, in the downturn in the early 1900s for LA and underestimate a little bit for the current recession. Um, these are estimates for uh, the initial wealth of uh, the borrowers, um, which sort of they follow house price patterns, uh, and these are estimates of the lender's premium in each period. <coughs> so in the counterfactual, um, I introduced the continuous workout mortgage, which is basically, it has the same per period payment as the fixed rate mortgage, except the balances evolve in a way such that they're indexed uh, to what happens to house price appreciation. The important features of the continuous workout mortgage are that the loan to value ratio will never rise above 100% if it started below 100%, and that the mortgage uh, doesn't, pay, doesn't pay off with after T periods of probability one. It can be paid off early. Um, so the counterfactual mortgage interest rates, uh, each point is a year uh, for the counterfactual simulation. Uh, so we see that, uh, 
For the risk sharing mortgage, the interest rates are higher when house price appreciation is low or negative. Uh, and we see that it's lower than fixed rate mortgage uh, when house price appreciation is high. Uh, this plot shows uh, equilibrium take up rates with respect to house price appreciation. Again, each point uh, is a year of the counterfactual. And I just want to point out that uh, when house price appreciation is low, that's when uh, people are less likely to use the continuous workout mortgage. And the reason is that uh, they have to pay a higher per period payment, right? And so um, to the extent that they're trading off between uh, stability in housing equity and consumption flows, uh, depending on the income of the consumer, they may not wish to do that. And so this just shows uh, the consumption equivalent in terms of welfare gains uh, for each year of the counterfactual simulation. We see obviously that when take-up rates are low, uh, there are very few gains. Uh, but when take-up rates are high, uh, the gains go as high as about $6,000 per year. Um, OK, and so finally, uh, this graph shows the simulated default rates in the counterfactual. <coughs> um, so the simulated default rates on the green line uh, sort of tracks uh, the default rates under the fixed rate mortgage in the early periods because like, we, uh, like I showed, uh, take up rates are low. So it's just gonna be similar to as if everyone had fixed rate mortgages. But crucially, in the early and mid 2000s, take up rates are high. So when house prices did collapse in 2007 and 2008, we end up with a much lower default rate uh, in those years. <clears throat> Okay, so just to conclude, um, <clears throat> the main points are that in a competitive mortgage market, the risk sharing mortgages will have to be priced appropriately. Uh, they're going to be more expensive in periods of expected decline, less expensive in periods of expected growth. And uh, because of this, take up rates are low in periods of expected decline and high in periods of expected growth, which suggests that the homeowners in my model appear to care more about cash flows than housing equity. Um, and I'll also say the benefits may currently uh, be understated because we're not endogenizing house prices and not modeling some of the externalities. Um, but the benefits could also be overstated because I'm sort of not capturing, uh, for example, basis risk and moral hazard, which are what distinguishes shared appreciation from continuous workout mortgages. Um, so, you know, a lot more work to be done, um, but, you know, I, I think it's a sort of promising uh, kind of mortgage contract to think about. Thank you.